don't understand anything about men, he's for sure an adulterer. What do you mean, they say? He says very simple. You see, the man, this adulterer, only wants the woman when she's married. And if the husband eats the cookies, there's no more husband. She's not married anymore. And the nature of male psychosexual desire is his interest is in boundary breaking. He wants her when she's married. So therefore, he's probably an adulterer. That's why he needed to keep the husband in the picture. All of you engaged in adultery at this moment, think about that. Okay. But no show of hands, please. This is not a sharing session. Okay. Now... Follow for a second. Now, here's the point. And the Talmud then concludes that passage by saying the following. Rabbi Isaac said, This idea that the man only wants the woman when she's married is the source of the verse, Mayim gnuvim yumtaku v'lechem starim am, Stolen waters are sweet. And says the Talmud, Miyom shenechrav beit hamikdash. And this Reality in the world only became true from the day the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. From the day the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, nitla tambia venitna la ovrea vera. Right? The radically available, easily accessible power of erotic sexuality was taken out of the frame of licit sexuality and made more easily available, accessible. Right, in the realm of illicit sexuality, that is, says the Talmud, the demarcating feature of the fall of the temple in Jerusalem. That's a very strange claim to make. Right? What the Talmud is saying is that somehow or another, the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, which you're beginning to understand, I think, is a mythic event. It's not about a particular building in Jerusalem being destroyed at a particular time. The fall of the temple is a mythic event. The fall of the temple signals, now stay with me, signals, signals a change in the nature of sexuality and the nature of psychosexual desire, right? In the nature of relations, something essential shifts in the world, right? And there's this move from the ability to find deep and profound satisfaction in boundaried sexuality towards a great and overwhelming desire and perhaps only an ability to find sexual satisfaction in boundary breaking sexuality. And that shift, are you with me? You with me? Right, do the work. Do the work, okay? Right, no easy listening here, okay? But it's perfectly followable, okay? Kind of sometimes when we kind of go to like the Omega Esalen, you know, kind of world, you know, we say, okay, if we're not chanting, right? No, no, I don't use my mind. I just experienced in my body. That's bullshit, okay? Right, any real enlightenment always has to engage body. You've got to experience it in your body. God in the first person. It's got to be interpersonal. God in the second person, second face of God. It's got to be conversation. And you've got to use, ma- got to use mind. Right? You've got to use all three. Right? To exclude any one of the three is to deface the divine. So I invite you to listen with your emotion. Listen interpersonally within yourself. Listen with your body and listen with your mind. And it's gentle step by step. If you get lost at some point, just that's okay, let it go. Step into the next point. But you actually can do it and it's gorgeous. Okay? So we've got this image. We're, a, we're at the end of step one. The image is we're looking for the grail. The grail is the temple in Jerusalem. It's the ark. It's the raiders of the lost ark. We want to recover temple consciousness. It's the basic spiritual move of our entire Western civilization. So we look and try and isolate what is the ark. So the ark seems to strangely be identified not with meditation or spirituality of any form. It's identified directly with sexuality. One, two cherubs sexually intertwined atop the ark of the covenant located in sanctum sanctorum in the holy of holies. And number two... Number two, this Talmudic image which says that the shift that takes place when the temple falls is a shift from satisfaction to be found in boundary sexuality to satisfaction to be found in boundary-breaking sexuality. So what does this mean? Step two. Okay, let's just kind of sink in for a second. What does this mean? What's this about? What's this mystery? This is called in Kabbalah the secret of the cherubs. It's never been taught publicly until the last five, six, seven years when two of us in the world started teaching it. It needs to be taught today for many reasons. It's not written in any particular Kabbalistic text. You can only find it by kind of, kind of wandering for 20 years in the orchard and kind of finding this phrase and that phrase and that phrase until you realize right, this is what they meant when they said in that phrase, the secret of the cherubs. So I want to unpack it to you. It's a gift. 
I want to treat it with great holiness. It's a transmission. It's a transmission I received in my lineage. I want to transmit it to you. I transmit it to you with some fear and trembling. Perhaps the masters were right to keep it a secret. Right? My great belief is now is the time particularly when it needs to be revealed, but I want to hold it right, in great honor. Right? I want to hold it right, in great trepidation. I want to hold it in great love. So here we go. Step two. What is the temple about? What is temple energy about? The Templars, the stonemasons, right? right? All those movements in the world are about this temple energy, whether in Christianity, right? Christendom, whether in Islam, right? Tragically, the temple today in Jerusalem, right, remains this energy focus in the world, right? I mean, it's not an exa exactly an irrelevant issue. It's not some temple, right? God knows where, right, in, in, in Tanzania, which is a gorgeous place, but actually this is the center, right, of the energy of the world, right? Several blocks from here, Several blocks from here, right? Two towers were taken down brutally. Thousands and thousands of people were killed, right? Not unrelated to this temple we're talking about. So if you think this is kind of some abstract issue, actually, this is the compelling energy at play in the world. The tragedy today in the world is that the argument's about who owns the temple. But actually, temple means holy. And holiness and ownership are opposites. Did you hear that? You can't own the temple. The word temple in Hebrew is mikdash. It's the holy. You can't own the holy. There is no ownership. Ownership is a contradiction to the notion of holiness. And we need to actually reclaim what is this temple energy about and weave it in the world or this temple energy itself threatens to undermine right, the very fabric of our civilization. And you don't need me to tell you that. You just need to open the newspaper to understand that's actually profoundly true. So it's actually time right, to shift something in the cosmic fabric and to try and reclaim right, what is right, this temple energy. Okay. So here's our statement. Here's our thesis statement. I'm going to do kind of. I'm going to try and do with you now about 10, 12 hours and about a half hour. So we're just going to kind of dance a little bit, okay? Here's our thesis statement. Step three. Here we go. Step in if you can, please. Okay? Thesis statement. The temple is not about the sexual. That is not what the temple's about. The temple is about the erotic and about a particular relationship between the sexual and the erotic. Now hold with me. What's eros? It's a Greek word, right? From Plato's Symposium. What is eros? What does the erotic mean? Right? When you tell someone erotica, what do they think immediately? Sexual. Right? Those words are confused, right, in our society. And that confusion is the source of exile and of pain and of alienation and of loss of consciousness. So let's, let's do a clarification here. What is the erotic? If you will, I'll tell you a story. Actually, I'll tell you a beautiful Buddhist story that I heard about a year ago, a year and a half ago, a new version of it, I was in Dharamsala, in Baksu Dharmkat, and the Dalai Lama had invited me there to spend a day dialoguing with him about Buddhism and Hebrew wisdom. And one of the people in his circle right, told me this version of the story, not about the Dalai Lama, but about his father. Right? Apparently, this version goes. And apparently what had happened is a particular Chinese Kung Fu master right, had come. A particular Chinese Kung Fu master had come to to Tibet and was walking the back roads of Tibet and seven, eight monks would try and stop him. He was violating a whole series of Tibetan laws and before they knew it, they were on the ground, right, fully broken bones, right, destroyed and he, he had just kind of barely moved and there was great fear until finally the Chinese Kung Fu master is invited by the Dalai Lama who was then 10 years old, right, to visit in Padalya, to visit in the Dalai Lama's palace enters the palace, you know, all the monks are kind of gathered around, and he bows, you know, a bare bow before the Dalai Lama. They look at each other, and the Dalai Lama says, you know, please show me your dance, right? You're set to incarnate Shiva, show me your dance of destruction. And so he doesn't move. The Dalai Lama feels kind of like a little wisp of air. He says, now, now please show me your dance. And he says, my dance is over. It went so fast you weren't able to see it. But in my dance, what I could have done, and he goes through marking the absolute destruction he could have wrought on the Dalai Lama's body. The Dalai Lama looks at him. And this was told to me by Lak Dorsala, by the Dalai Lama's assistant. He, he says to him, you know, I have a champion, actually, who can best you. So kind of all the monks kind of shrink back, right, hoping he's not talking about them. And, and he says, well, if you can, bring him forward. And if this champion bests me, I will leave Tibet and return to China. And so out walks, you know, about 25 minutes later, the old dancing master of Tibet. 